Praise the Lord. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter number one. Hey guys, Easter's coming up. I love Easter. I love Easter for a thousand reasons. But one is the, the church smells more like cigarettes and alcohol on Easter morning than any other day of the year. I don't want to ride in a cruise ship to heaven. I want to be hooked and riding and working on a fishing vessel. And I have fished the bulk of my life. And the only fishing vessels that do not smell like fish are ones that are not catching any fish. New Heights Church is a fishing vessel, praise the Lord. We want the lost, the hurting, the bleeding, the dying, those who don't know God loves them. And we have one singular purpose to reach them. So uh, Easter is coming up. Easter is our great day. Without Easter, Christmas wouldn't matter. But because of Easter, Christmas is that much more fun. But I want to talk this morning and kind of set the stage for potentially the next few weeks. I want to talk about discovering your purpose in God. I want to talk about the, the realization that your purpose is probably the most valuable thing for you to uncover once you know Jesus. Because the, I've heard it said, the most important day, there's two, the two most important days in your lives are the day that you're born and the day you realize why. You see, when you have a purpose, you can then see that what God has for you is significantly better than what he brought you out of. In other words, living for God begins to fill up your windshield so that what is in your rear view no longer entices you to turn back. Because there are things in the body of Christ that we can grow stale to. We can become calloused to the sound of the hurting. We can come, become callous to the sound of the oppressed. We can become callous to the fact that the Spirit of God, when we get in this place and when we're uh, worshiping God and magnifying God, how He moves among us. You can become callous to that. But when you develop your, when you realize that your purpose is developed by God and is very influential in your life, now all of a sudden everything begins to push you in a direction that God has called you. In other words, your purpose can drive you and nothing else does. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In other words, let us make man look like us and be like us. Let us make humanity look like us and be like us. Let us make mankind after our... So when God looks down, it's almost like he's looking down at a reflection. You are a reflection of God, both in your... So when you get to heaven and, and you meet Jesus and, and you see his father sitting on the throne, you're not going to be shocked. He's not going to look like... Uh, some kind of mythological creature, he's going to look a lot like me, praise the Lord. <laughs> he's going to look a lot like you. You're in his image, you're in his reflection, and you're in his likeness. In other words, you're like him. You are similar to him. So that's why one uh, day doesn't satisfy you completely in him you are like him he longs to be close to you so when you begin to know him you long to be close to him because you are similar to how he is we're in his likeness and his image and he says this he says now let them let humanity have dominion over the fish of the sea the fowl of the air over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God says, let's make absolutely sure that mankind understands that humanity is made to look like me and be like me. 
And the next words out of his mouth were, let humanity have dominion or rule over the fish of the sea. In other words, there, there's kind of two sides to this. Fish don't have precedence over people, but it is our responsibility to try to make sure that we take care of the resources that God has given us. So the, the, there, there's two sides of the coin, seems like, in an argument. And I have found personally that most arguments are not cut and dry. Most of the time, if two people are frustrated with one another, there's enough blame to go around. So the same thing in an argument over how to handle the environment. The correct answer is not to put humans out on the street to try to take care of fish, but it's certainly not the answer to go and destroy every fish in the sea either. We are stewards. So just the same way, if I give you $100 and you put it in your bank account and you spend $500, it's not the money's fault that the money's gone, it's the steward's fault. But consequently, you wouldn't want to hold on to that $100 you know, as if you, you know, couldn't let go of it if one of your children or your wife or you or your husband needed something for $75. Now you're not being a good steward the other way. So God says you got to have dominion or steward this. you got to take care of things. Your home has to be stewarded. Uh, oddly enough, your relationships have to be stewarded. They have to be taken care of. They should be, they should be managed. It, it shouldn't take you know, the divorce attorney before you realize that there's a problem in your marriage. Somebody say amen. amen. So for us, we are in God's image and his likeness, and we are called to be stewarding, to be managing the things that, that, that God has put in our care, custody, and control. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, male and female, created he them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. First thing God did was he gave man dominion. The second thing he did was he blessed them. Don't you ever believe the lie that God doesn't want to bless you. Before man had the ability to do, had the opportunity to do right or wrong, God was already trying to bless him. Before Adam and Eve ever decided to serve God or, try, or decided to eat the fruit in the garden, God was interested in blessing them. The Bible says God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moves upon the earth. Somebody say this. Say, I have a purpose. I have a purpose. You have a purpose from God. If you're taking notes, just, just, just make that number one. Say, I have a purpose. You're not an accident. The reason we can't believe in evolution is multifaceted. Number one, the Bible doesn't describe evolution. It, 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 it is very obvious that there are minor adjustments in species over decades and, and hundreds and thousands of years with regards to whether or not an animal you know, has long fingernails or short fingernails, whether it climbs trees, doesn't climb trees. It, it's impossible to deny that. However, there is zero reference that has ever been discovered that would indicate that somehow humanity jumped out of, a, of an amoeba slime pit and that's how we got here. No, God took Shekinah glory... He took his image. He, the, the Bible says the glory of God basically cast a shadow, and, and I would say over the Son of Man. And the Bible says that God reached his hands, could have done it any way he wanted, but he wanted to have his hands involved in your life even before you knew him. And he took his hands and he stuck them in the dirt, which meant he was willing to get his hands dirty working with humanity. And he began to form humanity out of the dust of the earth. He propped humanity up and he says, this looks like me and sounds like me, but he realized humanity was incapable of doing anything so he took the pneuma he took the breath of his only uh, of, of God himself and he blew it straight into mankind and all of a sudden you and me were created in the image and the likeness of God and nothing else on the planet was created that way so the problem is not evolution the problem is if evolution were true which it is not then all of the sudden you don't have a purpose because you're just an animal. The Bible says you are not an 
accident. The reason that we understand the truth behind we, us not being an accident is because we know that God promises and tells us in his Bible that, listen to this, before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. That's why when you give your life to him, when you begin to serve him and follow after him, it begins to feel like you've known him forever because you have. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. So you're not an accident. You have an outlandish purpose. The world will tell you, find what makes you happy and do it. But I have found that what makes you happy changes. You can't just find with what makes you happy. You have to find what is the purpose that is already instilled in me and then ask God to help you deliver on that purpose. The Bible says God will give you the desires of your heart. That means if you desire a happy, healthy family, God is certainly willing to do that. But it also means from the beginning of time, God injected into you the desires that you would have. When you're driving down the road and you see somebody that doesn't have something on the side of the road and it breaks your heart instantaneously, that is a signal or a sign of one of the desires that God has placed on the inside of you. Therefore, everybody that's driving down the road may not be feeling that exact same thing, but it may be tied or linked to your purpose because your purpose is injected in God and you'll never walk into true joy until you discover your actual purpose and not just discover it, but actually begin to walk in it what happens or what 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 makes you happy is contingent upon what happens to you but joy is from God what makes you happy depends on what happens to you if I have a flat tire I'm probably not happy but I've still got the joy of the Lord that's my strength if I don't have a flat tire I might be happier but that depends on what happens to me young people nowadays they're changing uh changing careers six and seven times before they finally uh get to a place of retirement or 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 get to an age where they don't want to work anymore but all these different things happen because everybody is chasing to try to satisfy themselves with how they make a living when god never said your satisfaction will be in your income your satisfaction comes in your purpose There are people that pump septic tanks for a living with a smile on their face, and I promise you they're not enjoying it. (laughs) That's because they have joy doing things because they have found a purpose that is greater than what they're actually doing in a moment. The moment you define to, the moment you begin to realize your uh, purpose, you stop living off of what makes me happy or what's just make me happy, what just makes me happy, but rather you begin to live based off what would you have me to do? Because he knows you better than you know you. He knows you better than your wife knows you. He knows you better than your husband knows you. So when you begin to discover your purpose. Everybody say purpose. Purpose. You begin to discover your purpose. Now all of a sudden you begin to put things in proper perspective. It's easier to turn the other cheek when you realize they're the goal anyway. I'm trying to win you to God. So it's easier for me to turn the other cheek, sir, than it would have been otherwise because my purpose is greater than me being right in this conversation or you agreeing with me. Your purpose begins to drive you and position you. In other words, the first thing God gave mankind was a purpose. He said, I'm going to make you my image and my likeness. He said, I want you to have dominion. You have a purpose. From the very beginning, there was a purpose. When Jesus came to planet earth, he never took his eyes off of the cross. Because he came with a purpose to ransom humanity. Now, now wait a minute. You're telling me he never took his eyes off. Was he looking forward to it? Absolutely not. But the Bible says this. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the purpose that was set before him, he was willing to endure anything. 
Give God a hand of praise this morning. Number one, you have to know you have a purpose. Number two, we have to make sure we understand. Matthew 12, 25 says, a house divided against itself can't stand. A house divided against itself can't stand. That's why I look at Washington, D.C., and I go, I don't know how long that'll stand. Because it's a two-party system. Now, I'm not saying that three would be better. I'm saying any division makes it difficult to stand. I think we, the people, need to stand together. Somebody say amen. So for us, we have to recognize that any division, any multiple vision is actually division. It, it splits or causes to split. At this church, we have a very very simple vision. If you know it, say it with me. We exist to love people and point them to Christ. That's why we're here. We are here to love people and point them to Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that, that uh, we don't do other things necessarily, but everything goes through that filter. Everything goes through. Will this love people and point them to Christ or not? And if the answer is no, we don't do it. Praise the Lord. Because we have a clear purpose or a clear vision. Coming up uh, in, in, in less than 30 days is Easter. And Easter is when we get to really love people and point them to Christ. It's when we come to church specifically to serve and not to sit. Because the odds are when, when all of the people who come to church, and we may only get one crack at them, we may only get one crack to introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ that changed each one of us that already follow him, that changed each one of us and is continuing to We may only get one shot at them. So we position and prepare ourselves prayerfully before we ever get there that says before Easter Sunday gets here, I already committed to give up my parking spot. I already committed to give up my chair. I already committed to make sure that I was uh, ready to help and ready to serve because my purpose in loving people and pointing them to Christ is far greater than some temporary comfort that I might have. In your family, you say, what do you want? Well, I want comfort. That may be true in a moment, but the reality is if your kids are surrounded by lions, you don't want comfort, you want in the fight. Because the, your purpose is greater than anything else that drives you in your life. In other words, if the, if the why, if the reason we are doing it is big enough, we will figure out how to do it. I've never met anybody that doesn't do what they want to do. They may act like they don't do what they want to do. I don't ever get to do what I want to do. The fact that you're saying that proves to me that you are actually going to do what you want to do, no matter what anybody else says. But the reason behind a thing is the driving force that causes you to complete a thing, that causes you to endure. In other words, that causes you to continue to pursue your purpose because if the purpose is great enough, I, I, I've been in the, the, the hospital when, when all three of our children were born and I just want you to know, as a man, I wouldn't have done it once, praise the Lord. But the purpose that drove the whole thing was so phenomenal. And, and I'll never forget, it would go from like, like everything is just wild and crazy. And then all of a sudden, the baby comes out and there's no more noise. There's no more, the, the nurses aren't running around. Nothing, and you lay the baby on mom's uh, lap and mom squeezes the baby. And it's as if everything was instantaneously forgotten. The sleepless nights, the issues, the rolling over, the, the cucumbers and ice cream, praise the Lord. All of it just goes in the rear view mirror because the purpose is high enough that the reasons, uh, the reasons to do it are motivated amongst themselves. We're not trying to come up with why because we're not trying to come up with how because the why is big enough. If I told you, would you swim across a, a raging river with crocodiles and alligators, you'd say absolutely not. But if I told you your baby's on the other side of the river, you'd jump in without a snorkel. Because the why, the reason to do something has to be bigger than everything else. 
It has to be bigger than how. It has to be bigger than what. That's why we never, you'll, you'll, you'll never hear us saying or limiting what we believe God's going to do through this ministry. You'll never hear us, you'll never hear us uh, limiting what God is going to do in this ministry. Because the purpose of this ministry is so grand, I don't want to have a box around what we're going to do. I just want to be effective. I just want whenever each one of us go to heaven and Jesus said, how was it on planet earth? I want you to go, well, Jesus, we just spent a lot of time loving people and pointing them to you. Praise the Lord. He's going, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in here, you know. Come on, give God a hand of praise. You have to stay the course. That's why, that's why this, get this. I'm just going to give you a few things we do and a few things we don't do. Because our purpose is so great. I'll start with what we don't do. We do not complain. Our purpose is too great. If I find out something about you, I'm not telling Billy. If I find out something about Billy, I'm not telling Willie. If I find out something about Willie, I'm not telling Nilly. <laughs> we don't complain. We, we just, we just, we don't have time to complain. Listen, in your family, you don't have time to complain. If there's a topic that needs to be discussed, discuss it, but position the discussion where you decide this is not going to come from a place of complaining because our purpose as a family is too great. We have too much to do. We've got to get these kids raised. We've got to get these grandkids raised. We've got to make sure that we're pointing them to God. Our purpose is too great for us to be fussing and feuding all the time. So we don't complain. The socks are on the floor. Pick the socks up. They're not my socks. You're one. Sir, pick up her socks. (laughs) We don't complain because our purpose is too great. Number two, we risk it for the biscuit. (laughs) We risk it because our purpose is that great. What do we risk? Our reputation. A A little discomfort. What do you mean? I mean, when you feel that nudging, and the more you do it, the more you'll feel it, by the way, to have a conversation about Jesus with somebody that you're interacting with, whether it's a family member, friend, or somebody that you've just met, you understand going in, this might feel uncomfortable. But our purpose is so big that we risk it anyway. This might even disrupt my day a little bit. But our purpose is so grand that we risk it. We risk a little discomfort. We're we're willing to risk our reputation among people that are not godly. And I'm not trying to throw rocks at anybody that's not godly. I just mean they don't know Jesus. What I'm saying is we are not putting our reputation as the epicenter of our focus. Our purpose is the epicenter of our focus. And it might require, matter of fact, if you do it for God and you do it the way his Bible says, it will require some risk. You're going to have to... When Jesus calls you, step out of the boat of comfort and walk on the raging waves. This is what I was talking to Pastor Reggie last night. He called me and we were just talking about the Lord. And he was telling me what he's preaching. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so good. I'm going to preach that too. Praise the Lord. He said, what are you preaching? I was telling him. And he goes, hold up, hold up, hold up, man of God. Hold up, man of God. Give me that second point again. And I could hear him writing. <laughs> hold up, hold up, hold up, man of God. Hold up there. Give me that second point again. I said, I said man, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you've been doing this a long time. He said, yeah. I said, every measurable metric, every measurable entity in my life is better than it's ever been. Personal, church, business, family, everything. God is faithful. I said, but I spent the day today on the carpet, on my face before God, telling him, why, God, do I feel like I need you now more than I have ever need you, needed you? He said, because your, I'll paraphrase, your purpose 
always drives you. Everything says everything's perfect. And I'm saying, God, we've, we've, we've conquered three mountains. Now I want five more. I said, Pastor, I said, I said, tell me, is, is this the standard? He said, I spent three hours with Bishop Jakes the other day having lunch, just him and my wife, Pastor Kelly. And he told me, if you can't figure out how to enjoy the fight, you will be miserable in ministry. There has to come a realization in the body of Christ that your purpose is what drives us, not our comfort. You're going to have to risk some stuff. You're going to have to throw some things out there knowing they might not understand. Knowing they might not, they might not even appreciate it necessarily. And be wise about it, but understand you're going to have to throw some things out. Number one, we don't complain because our purpose is too great. We risk it because our purpose is so great. Number two, we're going to, number three, we're going to have to change some habits because our purpose is too great. If you're naturally sarcastic, I am, you're going to have to recognize when it's funny or it's hurtful. If you're really good at arguing and you say, man, I'm so good at arguing, my spouse could never beat me at arguing. If you win every argument, you're wrong. Because we're going to have to change some stuff, not because, not because uh, of, of, of a uh, false ideology. Our purpose is just too great. I pray oftentimes, God, never let me forget that heaven and hell's on the line. Never let me forget with what we're accomplishing or not accomplishing or what we're wrestling with or what we're seeing or the struggles or the trials or the successes or anything between. Never let me forget that the reality is heaven and hell's on the line. Let me preach your gospel in a way, Lord God, that people come into this building or wherever I may be preaching at that time, but they come into this building and their hearts burn within them for the love and the knowledge of who you are because heaven and hell is on the line. Let us never, ever forget these things. And it might require us to change some of the characteristics about our life listen if an animal can can evolve and and grow longer fingernails to climb a tree or whatever certainly those who are made in God's image and God's likeness can change some of our characteristics so that the next generation is not dealing with the same nonsense that we dealt with (laughs) certainly we can make a shift certainly we can decide just because my parents were rude doesn't mean I'm going to be rude Just because my parents were racist doesn't mean I'm going to be racist. That stops with me. Just because my parents were were, were poverty, uh, 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 they may not have been in poverty, but might have had a poverty mentality. Everybody's out to get me. Everybody's trying to hurt me. Hold on to everything I've got. Oh, make sure. No, that's too expensive. That's this. Just because your parents talk that way doesn't mean you need to talk that way. You stop. There are things that are going to, our purpose is too great to just be uh, uh, reciprocating everything that we've ever seen or been talked about around us. We've got to take a stand as Christians and say, we're going to change some of the characteristics and habits of our life if 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 one of the habits in your family is to eat a half a gallon of bluebell ice cream at midnight every night i think that's a good one but (laughs) there are some results that will come with that you got to change some habits i'm going to preach a message i've been working on for two years two years and i'll give you i'll give you a couple of keys What's the first test that man failed? Food. What's the first test that the devil threw at Jesus? Food. Christians are dying before our time because food has become what we medicate with. Look at your neighbor said, move on, preacher. (laughs) I told you I've been working on it two years. I'll let you know when I'm ready to preach that. (laughs) Jesus, take the wheel. Number one, you have a purpose. Number two, we have to stay the course.
New Heights Church is not here to entertain Christians. Because our purpose is too great. Our purpose is too great. We have too much to accomplish. We have, we have too much to do this side of heaven. We're not here to, to entertain society or Christians. We are here to love people and point them to Christ. That means, that means we are hoping that people come here that don't know God. That room that, that's built out in the lobby there, we're thinking about some names for it, but that room that's out in the lobby there, that room exists to help us love people and point them to Christ. And what we're going to do is we're going to take, because the Lord has really impressed upon my spirit, the idea of discipleship at a higher level. So what we're going to do is, starting in April, uh, probably at the 10 o'clock service, when people get born again, when people get saved, when people come to know God, when people rededicate their life to God, or they just know they need a pick-me-up and they need some more uh, good, firm teaching, good, solid teaching on the Word of God, we're going to tell them, hey, if you just came to know God, your next step is come to church, because everybody needs to come to church, but then come at the 815 service and then go to 10 o'clock for the unbroken faith discipleship class so that you can get built up in God because Pastor Brian and the First Touch team, they're not going to be with you Monday morning. You're going to need to be able to stand on your own two feet knowing that God is holding you and, 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 and supporting you and, and, and helping you in every way. But you got to be ready. You got to be ready to live for God, and that means they've got to find their purpose. Because if they can't find their purpose, any old thing will move them around. But if we can help them find their purpose, if they can get linked up with the vision of loving people and pointing them to Christ, now all of a sudden everything begins to shift and everything begins to put in gets gets put in different uh, perspective. Your priorities change. You begin to rely on the provision of God and you begin to keep your eyes dead focused on the one thing that Jesus stays focused on, people. I know I say this all the time, but even the people you don't like, even the ones that, 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 are, that are rude to you and harm you and, and, and say things to you that you wish they hadn't said and, 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 and do things, and, and they're, they're, I, the ones that get me the most, I'll just be honest with you, if I could just, you know, since it's just us here, praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> Christians that lie to you. I don't want them to go to hell, but I want them to get close. <laughs> That's a joke. You got to understand, he's focused on them too. So when they do or say something to you that is dishonest or hurtful or something, our response should not be a return or a rebut of venom, our response should be to hit our knees and to ask God, forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they are doing. Not from an arrogant perspective as if we, as if we have ourselves completely figured out because we do not have ourselves completely figured out, but from a place that says, thank God this happened to me because God, you love me and you've taught me that perfect love covers a multitude of sins. I am here, Lord God, to cover this. I'm not gonna let it be known around. I'm not gonna talk about it. Let them know we are not the type that eat our wounded. We are the type that are a place where everybody knows that even if you fall on your face before God, we are here to pick you up, prop you up, hold you up, and love you through the process of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. There's something about living for God that your purpose begins to take precedence over all of your little feelings. Last one. Your purpose surpasses your political position. We do not have to agree on everything. You do not have to agree on everything with everybody that you care about. But if you jump in the vile and hostile rhetoric of those that are being paid to talk that way, if you jump in that on one side or the other, you will lose your voice with the other side. Completely. You will not be able to have a conversation, which means your purpose 
has to exceed your political position. And if you're not having conversations with people that don't look like you, sound like you, and believe like you on every facet, you're missing out on one of the greatest parts of God's creation. The diversity of humanity. You'll find that the same way that you came up with your decisions based off of your experiences and information, they came up with their decisions based off their experiences and informations, information. And the moment you begin to recognize humanity in the situation, now all of a sudden compassion begins to come back and the rhetoric begins to die down and you just want a solution. You just want a solution. Our purpose, we have to recognize we have a purpose. We have to stay the course. Matthew 4 and 18 says this. Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, saw two, two brethren. They were fishing. Simon called Peter and, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net in the sea for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20. And straight way. Somebody say straight way. Straight way. They left their nets and followed him. Number three, purpose requires action. Straight way. Straight way. Straight way. They were fishing. Jesus came and spoke to them. They dropped their nets. And straight way, they put action behind what Jesus said. Your purpose requires action or your purpose will be lifeless. Your kids and grandkids don't just need to hear about you serving God. They need to see you serving God. They need to see that you have your hand to the plow. Purpose requires action. And action is always best taken right now. We have Easter coming up. It's going to be wonderful. It's our day to shine. At this church, our first touch team is what makes everything happen. From the parking, really before the parking lot, but from the parking lot all the way down to the wonderful ladies in the nursery loving on the babies while we're in here teaching and talking. Even my 11-year-old daughter now serves in the nursery because our purpose is greater than anything else that drives us. And we didn't ask her to serve in the nursery. She said, am I old enough yet to get to serve in the nursery and love on the babies? Because her whole life, she has seen her mother pour into children. And ser- before we were pastors even, long before we were pastors, serving the house of God, serving the things of God. Now all of a sudden, we're not trying to make them do it. They are longing to do it. It's our reward. Why do we endure the nursery? For the joy set before us. Why do we endure the parking lot? Our parking team is the best on the planet. I'll drive up <laughs> super early. It's raining and cold. And they've got these, most of them, they have these super awesome jackets like go to the ground, super awesome. And man, they're just out there waving, got their cup of coffee. More than any other ministry in our church, every single week, somebody makes a comment. A first-time guest makes a comment about our parking team. Our media team never gets, never gets the uh, 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 recognition that they deserve. They're here hour, two hours before service sitting back in a dark cave, clicking on computers and watching everything so that if you can't make it to church, you can still have church with us so that you can watch things happen. Our ushers, they help not just usher in the people, they help usher in the presence of God because God loves to function when things are in order. So if we have an altar call and everybody's just standing everywhere, it just gets difficult. But if we've got ushers that are saying, hey, come on, right here to the middle. Let's, let's work this thing out. If God starts moving and something supernatural starts happening, they're there. But not just supernatural. They're standing at the door making sure if you walk in late that you don't have to find your own seat, praise the Lord. 
It's getting harder to find a seat in here, by the way. Our wonderful hosts greet people at the door, give them a beautiful tour of the church. They get spoken of so highly. Our hospitality team that does a phenomenal job when we have events, the, the children's uh, workers, the worship team, the, 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 the camera crew, literally there, there's people that have their hand in the plow all the time in every facet, but that's how it works. Straight way they left their nets and began to help pursue the purpose that God put in them. If you don't serve on a, on a first such team, I, I encourage you today, stop by the tent. Amen. Stop by the tent right after service. Have a conversation. You said, man, I don't know how to do anything. That's good. We'll teach you how to do everything. But then, now when Easter gets here, now we're ready. We're ready to love people and point them to Christ at a higher level than we were if we're just sitting back. Our prayer team, when, when something comes up, a, 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 a prayer chain goes out immediately and the saints begin to pray for those who don't even know it. When, when somebody is, 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 is in need, we begin to pray and we begin to believe God. There are things happening all the time. You can just, you can just grab, but somebody's got to take action. Somebody say action. Somebody's got to take action. And the thing is, in the body of Christ, nobody is, is, is more qualified than the willing because God doesn't use people who are capable I'm proof of that he uses people that are willing stand to your feet this morning if you could this Easter we're going to do we do a funeral on Good Friday. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But it's a modern day depiction of what a funeral for Jesus would be like. It's very, very moving. It's very emotional. It's very powerful. Because it reminds us that Jesus didn't just raise from the dead. He actually did die. Which is where the purchase of our salvation came from. But, but on Friday, we're going to do, get this, three services with that funeral on Good Friday. Because last year we did two, and it was wall-to-wall, standing room only. So because we're, our building isn't bigger yet, we're just going to have to add another one. On Saturday, we're going to have an Easter fest here on the property. We're going to have egg hunts, food, face painting, bounce house. It's just going to be uh, gobs of fun. And people are going to come to a place, and they're, gonna, they're thinking they're just coming for Easter eggs. But they're going to find out the real meaning of Easter. Then they're going to come Sunday morning to one of our three services. They're going to give their heart to Jesus. The next weekend, they're going to get water baptized right here. And then they're going to start going through the unbroken faith discipleship classes. Because our purpose is too big to do it have way. With your kids, and I'm getting this real strong, and then we're going to close. With your kids... Wherever you are, whether they're 30 or whether they're thir- or whether they're, they're, they're going to be born next week, don't you do it halfway. Don't you do it halfway. Don't you do the relationship halfway. Don't you do the prayer life halfway. Their purpose is too great for a half effort. So we go all in with our purpose. Bow your head, please. Close your eyes. If you're here today and you're not right with God, you're not living right, you're not doing right, I want you to know before God gives you a purpose, He makes you new. Remember in Genesis, He said this. He said it real simple. He said, I make you in my likeness and in my image. Then He began to give a purpose. But you have to be made new. You have to become that new creation. If that's you and you're, you're here and you're not living right, you're not doing right, Jesus is not Lord of your life, or maybe you'd say it differently. You'd say, Pastor, I feel like I might know him, but I've walked away from God. He might still be my savior, but I have not been a great friend to him. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to lift your hand tall and bold. And with an uplifted hand, you're simply saying, oh God, remember me. And he really, really will. If that's you, you've never said yes to Jesus or you need to rededicate your life. When I count to three, lift your hand. One, two, three, lift your hand. 
I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. Is there anyone else? I see that hand, thank you, sir. Listen, if you lifted your hand or you wanted to, pray this prayer after me from the bottom of your heart. Matter of fact, church, help us pray. Say this, say, oh God, I come to you now and I ask you to save me. Write my name in your book. I repent of my sins and I give my heart to you. Make me new today. Give me a purpose today and I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, Jesus is not mad at you. He just made you brand new. He just set your feet on a solid rock and you cannot be shaken. Take the card out of the chair in front of you and fill it out and mark on there that you gave your heart to God and let us send you some resources that can help you. And then be ready because we want you to go through those classes that start next April. Let's give them another big hand, (laughs) y'all. Last question I'm going to ask. Listen, we're coming up to Easter. Maybe you've been coming to our church. Maybe today's your first time or maybe you've been coming for a long time. But you say, preacher, I believe this is the house for me. So, well, how would I know that? Well, number one, you would sense it in here. You would sense a, a, a synergy. You would sense that God is speaking to you even when I'm talking. You would sense the worship as a strong opportunity for you to engage in God. If that's you, the Bible says this. Those that will get planted in the house of God will flourish in His courts. Flourish. So we want you to flourish. You know people that we don't know. You can help us love people and point them to Christ. You can help us love people and point to Christ that will never have a chance unless you pull the wagon with us. So if that's you and you've never uh, joined this church but you know you'd like to, uh, if that's you, when I count to three, lift your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you to the front. Nobody's going to make you speak into a microphone, but we do want to celebrate with you. If that's you and you say, preacher, I want to join the church today, when I count to three, lift your hand. One two, three, lift it up big and tall. Is there anybody here today? I don't see any hands. Don't forget guys, stop by the tent. Join our First Touch team if you haven't already. Also, if you've got anybody that's in sixth grade to 12th grade, youth is gonna start at five o'clock today. It's gonna be a wonderful time. Let me pray a blessing on you. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your people coming in, bless them going out, bless them in the city, and bless them in the field. Help our purpose always be the driving force in our life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday. Hey guys, we just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Here at New Heights, we are passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you've experienced today, You can also revisit this message you just watched or any other sermon at newheightschurch.info. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.